I'd like to um, start off, I want to tell you some extraordinary tales about the Salish Sea tonight, um, but I, I first want to talk about the word ecosystem. Um, and I think it's not a, it's a word that we all understand, but it's not a word that we all use. So we don't come back from Hawaii and say, people say, how was your trip, Joe? Oh, that was an amazing ecosystem. You know, you really should go there. No, we, we don't really say that, but we, we, we understand it, right? So if you think about the Everglades, and if I say Everglades, you're going to think about American alligator. You're going to think fresh water. Um, you're going to think about crazy things like anhingas, you know, snakes that look like birds that look like snakes. You're going to think of things like the purple gallinue. You're going to think of sawgrass and wading birds like the American white ibis. Um, and it may be even a place that some of the intrepid here have gone before. or maybe a place that's on your list to go to. Um, but I want to remind you that it wasn't always, the Everglades was not always a place that people wanted to be or wanted to go to. It was really first, when people, white people first got to South Florida, it was a swamp. It was a place that they said, we need to drain this. We need to fix this place. It's not, it's not useful to us as, as people. And it was really um, this woman, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, who wrote a book, 1947, this book was published. And it's, it really changed people's impression of the Everglades. It, let, it made them understand how the ecosystem worked. It made them understand what the beauties of, for the ecosystem, what the animals were that lived there, what the ecosystem did for water, clean water, and things like that. And it made them love that place. And, and it really turned it into a place that we now, it's the largest subtropical wilderness area that we have in the United States. It's a national treasure. It's a world heritage site. It's an international biosphere reserve. Um, and really, it was because people began to understand it, they began to know it, connect it, and then cared about protecting it. And that's really um, was the goal for Audrey and I in putting this book together, is we really wanted to um, create something that helped people to understand the Salish Sea, to know it, to connect to it, and then ultimately to, to protect this area. And we were very lucky because when Marjorie Stoneman Douglas was writing her book, she had the power of the written word. And we had that as well, but we also had the power of photographs. Um, so I have to start out by giving a big shout out, <laughs> at least a little shout out at this little goal would say, to all 55 of the photographers. Um, but really, the, the truth is that I, what I did know when I first moved to this place is I was, I was in love with this place. Like many of you guys that have, I met some transplants earlier tonight, I loved that I could walk down on the beach in front of my house and I could see a great blue heron pulling a green lean out of the water and knowing that that same bird, if not the same bird, the same species, could be right in front of the world's, one of the world's most amazing cities in Seattle doing the same thing. So here you have this amazing wilderness area surrounded um, encompassed by two major urban centers. There's no ecosystem like it in the world. And so that's how my journey began, just kind of absorbing as much as I could about this place and this huge steep learning curve. But there was always something that was missing along as the story went. And I, I was never really in touch with that. And then a few years ago, I realized what was missing was a name. Because when I moved here, we had Puget Sound, which is technically from Admiralty Inlet South. We had the Strait of Juan de Fuca, we had the Strait of Georgia, we had the San Juan Islands, we had the Gulf Islands, but there was never a name for this whole place. And, and in, in the 1970s, science researchers started looking at this area. They wanted to study this place because they were concerned about increases in vessel traffic from people bringing crude oil in from Alaska for refinement. Does that sound kind of familiar? Yeah. Um, and, and they started studying, they said, you know what, this place actually func functions like one intact ecosystem. When you go all the way north, if you get farther north the Campbell River, all of the influence from Johnstone Strait actually comes from the north part of Vancouver Island. But um, all the way down to Olympia, all the way up to Campbell River, it comes the oceanic influences come from the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And if you look at the genetics of some of the fish that like to stay in one place, you see this is all really one place. It functions like one place. And um, this guy, Bert Weber, who was a, a professor at Western Washington University, proposed the name in, the in 1989 to the Washington Geographic Board of Names. He said, let's call it the Salish Sea to honor the Salish, the Coast Salish, the first people that were here. And they said, yeah, Bert, that's a great idea, but no thanks. <laughs> and he said, why? They said, it didn't have enough common usage. People didn't know the name. They didn't think of it as the Salish Sea. And so about a decade or maybe actually two decades later, in 2008, he started pushing it again. And the Coast Salish actually were the first people to adopt this name at their Coast Salish gathering. And then after that followed the people of Washington State and the BC and the US and the Canadian federal government. And so an ecosystem was born. And ever since then, I just thought, 
we got to do a book on this place. we got to tell the story of how amazing this place is, how it works. And I was lucky enough at that point to meet my co-author, Audrey Benedict. Now, Audrey is a beautiful writer. She's a lovely person. Um, and uh, she said at one point I'd met her, she, she leads tours through Cloud Ridge, Cloud Ridge Naturalist. And I gave a talk for one of her tours. And we became friends. And afterwards, she said, hey, Joe, you ever think about doing a book on the Salish Sea? And I thought, yeah, I think about it every day. but..." I don't know how to do a book. I'm a barely competent scientific writer, you know? I don't know how to do all this stuff. And she said, well, I have a publishing company. We should do something like that. And she showed me a book that she had done uh, with her publishing company, Valley of the Dunes. And this book was very instrumental in getting the great sand dunes in Colorado declared a national monument. And I took a look at this book and I thought, if we can only do something half as good as this book, that would be awesome. And so um, Audrey, um, had a photo curator, Wendy Chatil, who, and she had a layout person, uh, Annie Dowden, and then she had an editor, Aunt Alice Levine, who was gifted enough to be able to bring Audrey's voice and half of the writing, and my voice and half of the writing, and m merge them together. And she was also gifted in hammering everything I wrote and make me feel very good about that. <laughs> so, so, and so, um, so I'm not really the geologist. Audrey's really ge the geologist. But really, we have to, when we tell the story of the Salish Sea, we have to start with the geology because geology is the foundation for the biology. And we struggled a little bit early on to say, how do we encompass the complex geology of the Salish Sea, something that has for millions of years been being formed by, you know, plate tectonics, sh shifting continents and, and um, volcanoes and, and glaciers. And, and Audrey said, well, let's just take a walk on the beach. And this is a picture that she and Wendy took up in uh, Birch Bay. And, and all they did is put a little bit of water on these rocks. And in these rocks, you can see every type of rock, whether it's, uh, you know, um, sedimentary or whatever, all the different rocks that tell the history of this place. So, you know, um, and if you look at the most recent history, it's really been about the last 1.8 million years through these the Pleistocene glaciations that carved this place, that gave us these jagged peaks, that gave us these U-shaped valleys, that gave us all of the, the things that we look at and we see today that, that is the topography of this place. And, and that extends from the mountains all the way down to the seashore, where you see things like the rocks that the gooseneck barnacles would be on, or all the way to the bottom of the ocean. And it's this complex um, geology, what we call geodiversity, that lends itself to the biodiversity of the area. And so I want to back up from rocks a little bit. And, I, and, and you're going to think it's a little weird because we're talking about a sea. But I want to talk about the forest first. Because without the forest, we don't have the sea. The Salish Sea is an estuary, which really, by definition, is a mixing of fresh water and salt water together. And all of that fresh water, sure, some of it comes down in rain, but it's the huge, huge area around the Salish Sea, all of these mountains that act like the giant sponge that absorb all of the water, whether it's snow or rain, and have this slow release down into the Salish Sea. And then we have the mixing of this ocean water with this fresh water that makes this place so productive. And so that concept of a forest and a sea being connected is sometimes hard for people to grab. And I say, wait, just think about the salmon, right? Because we have five species of salmon in the Salish Sea, all, all five species of Pacific salmon. It's the southernmost latitude where you can find all five species of Pacific salmon. And where does their life start? In the upper reaches of all these streams and rivers. They, they, they're, they're born, they travel down those rivers at different rates depending on which species it is and they go out to the open ocean, they put on about 99% of their body weight in the open ocean, and then they come back up those rivers, they spawn, they die, and their body goes not only to feed their young, but also to feed the forest. And you can see the DNA of the salmon in the trees that line the forest. So it's this connection between the fresh water and the salt water that they show us. And there's other animals that do that for us, that, that show us the example. Um, uh, ones like this. Now, some people look at this and they think, God, that American robin is trying to drown itself. <laughs> There's actually an American dipper. And it is a passerine bird, very similar to a robin, right? But it doesn't have wet feet, and it makes its living by diving under the water of fast-moving freshwater streams, where it lives uh, by eating freshwater invertebrates. And guess what else? Salmon eggs. The American Dipper is one of 138 different vertebrate species that depend on some life stage of the salmon. So it's, it's all connected. Let's look at another example. This is a marbled merlet. Marbled merlets 
and you can't tell from this picture, but they are alces, which is like a northern counterpart to the penguin. This is a bird that spends almost its entire life on the salt water. It dives, it swims with its wings underwater, it catches little fish, but where does it nest? Sometimes 40 miles inland in old growth forest. It wakes up in the morning and it flies, comes screaming out of the forest 30 or 40 miles where it dives under the water, catches fish, takes them all the way back to that old growth forest. And it really depends on that old growth. Once again, that connection. And if you don't think that I've convinced you enough about the power of fresh water for creating the Salish Sea, let's just look at this satellite image. Now, it's a little bit hard to figure out what's going on here first, so I'm gonna try and show you if I can. This is the greater Vancouver metropolitan area. And these are the San Juan Islands. That's my house, maybe my kids. The Gulf Islands, and what is this? This is the Fraser River Plume. So this is when you have the freshet or the, 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 the snowpack melt-off, that, that water is coming down the Fraser River and it can be emptying out, of, like you see here, at 2.6 million gallons a second. Okay, you can see it from the satellite and depending on where the wind is going and where the current's going, it can go up the Strait of Georgia, it can go across to the Gulf Islands like we see here, it can go south. And when you look at that from the water, here we see in the bow of Kevin Campion's boat, Orion, the deep green wilderness boat. Look at the, the look at the delineation there. On the right, what you're seeing is that fresh from uh, fresh water from the Fraser River, and that can be from six to 33 feet deep. Fresh water. Remember, fresh water more buoyant than salt water, right? And 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 as that comes in it, and remember, this is oxygen rich water. It has a little bit of nutrients in it, but nothing like the ocean water that's coming up the Strait of Juan de Fuca. That's coming from very very deep. It's very old very oxygen poor and it starts mixing together the San Juans act kind of like a big egg beater and then what you get going with the sunlight you start getting all this plankton this photosynthetic plankton and these zooplankton and some of the plankton are microscopic and some of them are macroscopic and it just sets the whole foundation for this place and if you think one of the big fallacies that I think people have about the Salish Sea they say that water is dark water is cold Everything under there must just be different shades of brown. And I'd say that couldn't be further from the truth. Any color that you could see in a, tr in a tropical uh, coral reef, you would see in the Salish Sea. And just a great example here, you can see here on this painted anemone. And I really, I love this picture by Mark Chamberlain because not only did he just take this picture, but he said, he reminded us, if you go closer, he's just gonna zoom in on one little spot here, you see something more. Right? You see these black and white sand fleas that are living on the tentacles of this anemone. Let's play the game. Let's do it again. Another one of his pictures here, this is a crimson anemone. Let's just take the center of the crimson anemone and let's look in there. What is that the most beautiful shrimp you've ever seen in your life? Yeah, it's so good you could eat it. <laughs> Candy stripe shrimp. <laughs> How about that? Um, and what's happening here is that shrimp and that anemone have a symbiotic relationship. That shrimp is protecting that anemone from other shrimp that are going to come in and pick at the anemone. And then the shrimp is living off all of the food that that anemone doesn't ingest. So they have a great little relationship, much like Nemo, right, and the anemone, <laughs> but way cuter. So eat your heart out, Walt Disney, huh? <laughs> And all of these things that are going on, there are these complex relationships. There are a lot of these relationships that are predator-prey relationships, right? And they're every bit as interesting as a cheetah screaming across the Serengeti and bringing down a Thompson's gazelle, okay? So what you see here is a leather sea star that's coming up to predate this swimming anemone, right? But, but I, I, I think what I want to do, let me give you a video and I'll just narrate the video, okay? So he's coming in to eat this guy, and, but he's not gonna take it sitting down, okay? He stands up, he says, no way, Batman. <laughs> Boom, he headbutts him. If he had a head, he would headbutt him. And he says, I am so out of here. And remember, way slower than the Thompson's gazelle moving across the Serengeti. Uh, but every bit is interesting, right? And that leather star is thinking, God, if I had a head, I would have a headache right now. <laughs> But just when you think that you've seen everything, right, um, boom, here comes the copper rockfish oh, thinking, no. maybe there's something in it for me. Maybe I can get something to eat. <laughs> and so as you start to look at all these complex relationships and all this stuff going on, it, the, it just becomes even more wondrous. So in the center, what you see here is a giant particle. This is the world's largest particle, not this one, but as a species, right? They can be as big as a softball. 
And all around it are these strawberry anemones. And what you see are the feet of the barnacle, these cirri that are coming out of the barnacle. And what they're doing is they're grabbing the ocean water and they're bringing it in to bring that plankton in. Now, if you look at the pectoral fins of this grunt sculpin, they look a lot like the cirri of the giant barnacle. And that's because this guy wants them to look like that. He hides out in the giant barnacle shells and he wants to look like a barnacle because he doesn't want something to eat him and he doesn't want who he's going to prey upon to see him. So when they come by, he can run out and grab them. And so we go on, and, and I want you to not make the mistake that I always make. I, I have this mistake, I call it the Gato's problem of naming. And I see something and I say, oh, that's a Glockoswingle, or oh, that's a northern kelp crab. And then sometimes, even to make myself feel like I know it more, I'll maybe give it a Latin name. Well, that's Puchetia productus. But if you just don't name and, and just look, things will tell you about themselves and what's going on. So right now, that kelp crab is saying, look, I know that my claw is not very big, and you're probably going to eat me, but I am going to do my best to pinch you right in the eye when you come down. And on this other arm, if I had fingers, I would be giving you the middle one right now, <laughs> giving the bird to the bird. <laughs> And they'll tell you about the natural history of them, right? So this, we know that this gull, this species of gull, is a generalist. He's going to eat anything he can fit into his mouth, and even some things he can't fit into his mouth. When we look at this rhinoceros ocelot, this bird is a specialist, right? This bird makes its living, it's an alcid, like the marble merlet that we talked about earlier, dives underwater, flies with his wings, and catches small schooling bait fish, right? These forage fish. But tell me this, how does that bird go underwater, catch a fish, and then go back underwater and catch another fish without losing the first fish? Is he tucking him under his wing or something like that? No, he's got little things on his, on his mouth and on his tongue that allow him to impale that fish on the bill. So when he opens his mouth up to grab another one, the first ones are there. And, and what's he gonna do? He's gonna fly, for a bird that spends its whole life on the water, he's gonna fly all the way back to a burrow that it's excavated or re-excavated that can be up to 15 feet deep where it's raising its young and it's gonna take that in there and feed its young. And I don't know if you guys knew this, but let me start by telling you my daughter, when she was a little kid, she had the fattest little hands. And, and you'd ask her, how many M&Ms do you want? She'd say, a handful. How much milk do you want for dinner? A handful. That was like her unit of measurement. Well, this is their unit of measurement, a billful. And so if you took a bomb calorimeter and looked at how many calories are in that bill of fish, that um, bill full of fish, whether there's 13 or 12 or whatever, or there's four, it's probably gonna have a similar amount of calories. So when that bill gets full, it knows, hey, that's enough calories to take back to my baby. And the, the feeding events, they're not happening in isolation, right? Everything's happening all at one time. So you may have the rhinoceros oculets over here. You may have the common murs on the right. These common murs can dive to almost 600 feet deep. And they're going down and they're schooling the fish up into a big ball. And they're starting to push them to the surface. And then the gulls who are plunge divers are coming down and they can only drop in maybe a foot or two in the water. They're grabbing them. And the humpback whale is coming through, thank you very much, and taking his bite, right? So all of these things are happening. And even if you just look at the connectivity from one species to the next, let's look at one of those, one of those uh, forage fish species, the sand lance, OK? So most fish that bury themselves to hide from predators, they all do it the same way. They come down, they land on a soft, muddy, or sand bottom, and they start shaking like a bunch of college kids in the mosh pit, and the sand and the mud comes up, and it settles down under their back, and then they're camouflaged. But not this guy, unique in all of these fish. What this guy does when he comes to the sand, he just hits it right with its nose, just like a lance beam pummeled into the sand and the tail starts working and it drives the fish in and after about two thirds of its body goes in it just gets sucked right underneath it there. And that's where it hides out to avoid predators. And then when it comes out, life is much easier, right? Um, so let's look at another fish. So this, I just saw my first uh, one of these a, a couple of weeks ago and, they, and this fish looks like a rat and a fish maybe got together and started a family. And it's named the spotted ratfish. It's a poisonous fish, only grows about two feet long but if you took all of the fish in the Salish Sea and you weighed them, the largest biomass of all the fish would be the ratfish, not the salmon, not the forage fish, but a, a fish that most of us don't even recognize, a fish that has no commercial value whatsoever. So there's all these little secrets. So, so let's talk about crazy some more. 
about this guy? This is a basking shark. Most people don't think about sharks in the Salish Sea. We used to have so many basking sharks in the Salish Sea that they were a nuisance. The Canadian federal government, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada, in the 1940s and 50s, invented a fishery and built a vessel, a harpoon fishery for these guys, because these 30-foot sharks were getting caught in people's salmon gill nets. And that can kind of ruin your day when you're trying to catch some salmon and you get a 30-foot shark caught in your net. So they thought, well, we'll take care of them, we'll annihilate them. And what you see happening here, they don't have teeth, they have gill rakers. And so this, this shark is going through the water and it can sieve 132,000 gallons of water an hour. And then the gill rakers take the plankton out of there when it goes by. It's completely harmless and where they have big populations of these around the world, it's a multi-million dollar scuba and snorkeling industry. So fortunately, Florian got these images for us to remind us that hopefully these guys are kind of going to come back to this area, not for us to uh, annihilate again, but hopefully for us to enjoy and appreciate. Um, and now I just want to show you my personal favorite, the uh, Pacific Spiny Lump Cycle, and, or as the Latin name calls it, the, you know, the, 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 the good little uh, orb or the good little globe. And they have cool little modified pelvic fins. They're not great swimmers, as you can imagine. And these, these little um, pelvic fins allow them to kind of suck down, hence the name the lump sucker. And I just want to show you this video I love from the Victoria High School because it kind of shows you about this. And so here he is. And look at the gunnel on the left. He's going like, seriously? Do you really think you're a fish? <laughs> He's going, I just need to wait here. The current is picking up a little bit. I don't feel right. The guy was like, seriously? Is that thing cute or what? Where's Disney? Why are they not making a movie about this creature, right? Yeah, so full of these amazing, amazing creatures. And, and we have a lot of those animals that live here for their whole lifetime. Some of them seasonally come through. And we also have animals that just come here for a fleeting glimpse of their life. But for them, this place is critically important. And, and this is an example of some Dunlins that are up by the Delta Port. And I was just up here two days ago. And there were probably about 12,000 Western Sandpipers and about 6,000 Dunlins at this area. And, and these guys are stopping over on their big migrations, right? Western Sandpiper may be going from Alaska all the way down to Peru, 12,000 kilometers, right? And when you weigh only 25 kilograms, a stopover is really, really an, an important place. And Audrey wrote it beautifully in the book when she said, they're epic journeys that stitch continents together on the feathers of a million wings. And I thought, God, I wish I could think of stuff like that. <laughs> and, and, and another thing, another, other ones that we have are like this. So this is the snowy owl. Most people think of snowy owls with Harry Potter. Um, but they actually really do exist in real life. And we don't see them, it's not like the, the Dunlin or the Western Sandpiper, we don't see them twice a year or once a year, we see them intermittently. See, they, they nest and live up in the Arctic and they're eating lemmings and things like that. And once the population would grow, and then maybe as the lemming population contract, you have birds that don't have enough to eat. So where do they go? They come to the Salish Sea and they go to areas like Boundary Bay, Manila Bay and areas like that. And they, they rest on the shore and then what are they doing? They're hunting grebes, they're hunting sea ducks, they're hunting shorebirds. So not even maybe for some of the animals, but for the long-term uh, sustenance of the, the stability of the population, the Salish Sea is very important for these guys. So how about mammals? So this is a great picture by my friend Phil Green out of Yellow Island in the San Juans. And it's like that naming game. Don't think, oh, I, I know that's a mink, and I know minks, <laughs> they can dive to about 10 feet deep, and they'll eat crabs and things like that. Just back up. I'm like, oh, Joe, just slow down and watch, because you may think you know what that mink is going to do, but you don't. None of you expected that guy to belly flop <laughs> into the water, but it was a good day for a belly flop. And I've judged belly flop competitions in Fort Lauderdale spring break. That is a very good belly flop. Okay? So keep your eyes open. And we haven't even started to get into, we have all of these birds and all of these mammals in the Salish Sea that breathe air, but they make their entire living almost underwater, where they're holding their breath. And how do they even do that? How, how deep can they even go? Like seals, seals can dive probably 1,600 feet deep, almost 1,700 feet deep. And all light stops about 1,000 feet. So, you know, th there's amazing things that are going on. And of course, um, we also have killer whales, right? And are they really killers of whales? Well, yes they are, and no they're not, right? We have three different types here in the Salish Sea. What you see is a little bit hard, takes a second to get this picture, but this is a southern resident killer whale that has a salmon in its mouth. And it's 
probably bring in that salmon. They'll actually bring the salmon over and prey share. So, hey, I caught a bite. You want some of that? Yeah, I want some of that. We're learning new things about them all the time. And they really depend on their fish eaters. Now, we have another type of fish eater that we see occasionally in the Salish Sea, closely related, but genetically distinct, called offshores. And we would see these guys strand, and sometimes half of their dental arcade would be worn down to the gum. And that's very interesting. What's going on? Because their teeth are really like Tyrannosaurus Rex teeth. And you know what? These guys, the offshores are shark specialists. And we think it's from wearing down their teeth from biting the skin of a shark. If you've ever felt the skin of a shark, it's like sand here. And then we have another species, uh, or another ecotype of killer whales, the not so politically correct transients that eat marine mammals. And I, I love this picture here by Jim Maya, because you can see the killer whales underneath uh, playing in the, in the wake of that uh, cargo ship, the container ship there. And I like this picture because it reminds us, one, that we're kind of an urban wilderness area. Two, it reminds us that everything that we do, whether on the sea or on land, impacts the Salish Sea. So these guys may be cavorting and having fun, but we have very, very good science that tells us that killer whales, let me back up for a second, they're not visual, right? If we gave them a copy of this book, they couldn't read it, <laughs> even if they wanted to, right? They're acoustic. They would need someone to read the book to them, right? Books on tape. And, and they live, they live, they live in the world of Stevie Wonder, right? And so they communicate with noise, and they, they create noise not through their, their part of their blowhole, goes out through their melon, it comes back, no ears, hits their jaw, comes back through the fat in their jaw, back to their ears, and they interpret it. And we know that when killer whales are in the presence of increased underwater noise, so vessel traffic, boats like this, they do the same thing that you and I do at a concert a rock concert, or the same thing my dad does when he's talking to a non-native English speaker. <laughs> speak louder and slower. Dad, he's not deaf, he just doesn't speak English. And so we know that they're doing that. So you can imagine them, they're hunting for some salmon, and they're saying, do you have some salmon over there? Right? And it's not even just their communications, but it's their echolocation. So they're sending out these clicks that come back, and we know that with increased sound, their ability to detect things with their echolocation, such as salmon, shrinks. So you may have a place where there's a small amount of salmon, and then a reduced ability to find that salmon. And so just like the killer whales, or just like all of the other species, we may use different ways to exploit the food resources, but we are as dependent on the biological productivity and the health of the Salish Sea as all the animals that we were just talking about. And there are ways that we can work that we're understanding that we can actually harvest mm -hmm. stuff. This, this is called a um, um, reef netting technique developed in the San Juan Islands by the Salish. And, and minimizing bycatch, so if a harbor porpoise is coming through, they can see that, they can pull up the nets. They can harvest it, and we're just learning how to harvest enough to make a living and to feed people, but not so much that we don't leave fish out there for the ecosystem, for the whales and all these other creatures. And we have a lot of resources here like that. We even have resources we don't harvest, um, ones I was telling you about for scuba diving or kayaking, and even those where there's not an actual harvest, they're big economic drivers in our community. They bring in money. Watchable wildlife is a multi-billion dollar a year industry in Washington State. And I love this picture by Wendy Chatil. She took out the mouth of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And um, because you see there's a couple, there's a lot of things going on. You see the timber harvest. You see the tugboat, the working vessel, the marine transport that's going to pull those timber, those logs out. You see the kayakers. You see the, the surfers out there. And everybody is being respectful of each other. And that's really what we have to do. We have to learn how to be respectful of multi-uses and balance everything that's going on. Because when you look at the Salish Sea, our cities, cities like Seattle, cities like Vancouver, they're not defined by their skylines as much as they're defined by their shorelines. And it's those shores, it's the Salish Sea that's lapping at their shore that's creating those million dollar views, that's making people want to immigrate here and live here. It's also producing the food that fills their bellies. It's sustaining the wildlife that fills their soul. So like it or not, we are the Salish Sea. We're not just a part of it. We are that. And we have to remember that we have an obligation to take care of this place. So this is a picture of Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and other First Nations up in Canada. And they're not just protesting the expansion 
of a of a pipeline that's going to end in there, um, right at, in, at the mouth of the Fraser River. They're also protecting their culture and they're protecting the resources that they depend on and the resources that we all depend on uh, here in the Salish Sea. And I want to leave you with our, our vision or our dream that we have for the Salish Sea. And really, and, and Audrey and I, what we said in there in the last paragraph of the book, we said, look, in our dream for the Salish Sea, it's a day when we all know and recognize our marine resources better than we now know and recognize our corporate logos. It's a day when we watch and we monitor the ecosystem better than we now watch the weather or monitor the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the NASDAQ, and we restore and we protect this place as if our lives depended on it, because they do. So I want to leave you with this last quote by E.B. White. I rise in the morning torn between the desire to save the world and a desire to savor the world. It makes it hard to plan the day. <laughs> and I want to leave you with that quote, not because I want to make it hard for you to plan your day tomorrow, <laughs> but I think it's an important reminder that we have an obligation as people of the CFC, we have an obligation to do both. To not go out there and take our kayaks and watch birds or go scuba diving, that's a crime. We need to savor this place. It's a gift for us. But we also need to save this place because we do depend on it. And so ways that you can do that, stay connected. You know, go to the aquarium. Sign up for those Sea Doc Society um, monthly free updates that I told you about. Tell people, I care about this place. I want to take, a, take, take care of it. So thank you very much for coming out tonight. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys have.